Good evening. Welcome to worship on this Wednesday evening. A special welcome to our friends at Grace in Northbrook who are joining us for this series. I'm Pastor Tom Knoll, one of the retired pastors serving here at St. Peter. Please note that tonight we are continuing in our series of Lenten hymns. Tonight we talk about the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. A reminder that this Sunday, March 7th, is an opportunity to drive up for communion, but you may also come throughout the week and pick up the communion elements to have at your home while you are worshiping. But we will be outside distributing on March 7th. On March 14th, the 10 o'clock service will resume. It will be live streamed as well, but people may come to that 10 o'clock service. It will be held in the Life Center. With that, we ask God to be with us and bless us as we worship together. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We listen now to um, our organist, Matt, as he speaks about today's hymn and the composer of that hymn. When I Survey the Wondrous Cross rises to the top of many people's list of favorite Lenten hymns, and indeed sometimes all the way to the top of their favorites of all time. This hymn was written by Isaac Watts, who was one of the most prolific and poetic of all English hymn writers, bringing us such classics as Joy to the World, O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past, and of course this one, which are the leaders of a vast body of writing, around 750 hymns in total. Isaac Watts was born in 1674, and even at a very young age, he had a strong attraction to using rhyme, which sometimes got him into and even out of trouble. He became a scholar of theology and a pastor at a chapel in London, and also worked as an independent tutor. He wrote many hymns over a period of time, publishing large collections of those hymns in 1707 and 1709. Now, in England at the time and other places of the Calvinist Reformed tradition, it was common to exclusively sing psalms uh, in the worship life of the church. We see a little bit of the influence of this tradition in some of his hymns, uh, including Joy to the World, which is a paraphrase of Psalm 98, and O God, Our Help in Ages Past, which is a paraphrase of Psalm 90. Even so, some of his hymns, such as When I Survey, represent a move towards newly composed, a very personal style of hymn, uh, which includes references to some of the New Testament epistles, as you'll soon hear. Uh, as well as personal reflections on Christ's suffering and a personal response to that. This didn't go over well in every church. Um, it often split a lot of churches who preferred uh, the older style of singing. One pastor even in America uh, rode horseback all the way from Kentucky to Philadelphia to the Presbyterian General Assembly just to convince them to not use Isaac Watts' hymns. Uh, fortunately, many people did appreciate singing this well-crafted new song of praise to the Lord, as well as his many other writings. In England, you'll often hear this sung to the tune of Edward Miller's tune, Rockingham. Uh, however, in America, we know it's much more familiar uh, to Lowell Mason's tune of Hamburg, Lowell Mason being one of the leaders of American church music and of music education. This tune was written in 1824, and first paired with this hymn several decades later uh, to become the hymn that we know and love today. Our scripture reading for this evening's service comes to us from Paul's letter to the Philippians in the third chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. But whatever was to my prophet... I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake 
I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing now the hymn for this evening, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, number 425. We'll sing all four stanzas, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Our message this evening is based on that epistle reading from Philippians, which I read a few moments ago, and also a passage of Paul, again, in Galatians chapter 6, the 14th verse. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. On the basis of this, these words of Scripture, and in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave his all for us, my sisters and brothers in faith. The hymn that you have just sung, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, was written by Isaac Watts, Matt talked about him earlier, in 1707. 
he actually wrote it as a communion hymn, which is interesting because it doesn't reference communion at all. But as I thought about it, I thought of the phrase that's quoted in both Luke and 1 Corinthians' version of the words of institution, do this in remembrance of me. The hymn talks about the crucifixion, but it also talks about how should we respond to what Christ has done for us. Do this. What can we do in response to what he has done for us? The hymn is thought to be the first hymn in English written in the first person. When I survey the wondrous cross, it makes it very personal. It has also been called the greatest English hymn ever written. The hymn is filled with many interesting poetic sounding phrases. Many times these phrases are showing real contrasts. So if you have your hymn books open to number 425, you'll see the last two phrases of the first stanza, my richest gain I count but loss. Gain and loss, contrasted. And then he goes on, and poor contempt on all my pride. But let's look at the beginning. When I survey, survey. In our hymn from last week, Jesus Refuge of the Weary, number 423, if you're in your hymn books, the phrase was, do I pass that cross unheeding? And Pastor Greiner talked about how we need to pay attention to focus on that cross. I think Watts here in this hymn goes just a little further. He says, survey. Looking that up in a thesaurus gives us words such as examine, study, inspect. So really paying close attention and spending time contemplating what? The cross. But notice in this case, it's the wondrous cross. That's what we call in English an oxymoron, where two words are put together that seemingly contradict each other. One of the most common examples, of course, is jumbo shrimp. But here, wondrous cross. What adjective would you use to refer to the cross? Maybe horrendous cross or horrible cross. Crucifixion was one of the most brutal and shameful ways to die. In fact, the scripture says in Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And yet, here it is called the wondrous cross. Again, checking the thesaurus, wondrous means wonderful, of course, amazing, miraculous. Extraordinary. All these things about that horrible piece of torture. But of course, it's because of what happened on that cross. Because there, through death, we are given life. Paul says in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law 
by becoming a curse for us. And then Paul quotes that Deuteronomy passage that I referenced earlier. So now we wear our crosses proudly. We display them in our homes. We have them prominently featured in our churches because there on that cross, as the hymn continues, the Prince of Glory dies. Prince of Glory is a phrase that is really the same as the Son of God. Because, of course, a prince is the son of a king. And glory was a word that was often used in the Old Testament when it was speaking about God, especially what we call theophanies, when God would appear. For example, in Exodus 24, Moses goes up Mount Sinai and sees the glory of the Lord. And there are many, many other examples. What I found interesting is that in John's Gospel, in the first chapter, which somewhat parallels Genesis, in verse 14 of that first chapter, where we have what we call John's Christmas story, and the Word became flesh, God became a man and lived among us. And then John goes on to say, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God becomes a man, but that man is still God. True God, true man. And then he dies. Well, that too is an oxymoron, you see. God is eternal. God can't die. And so he had to be born as a human being. The Word became flesh so that he could die for us. The rest of the hymn end of stanza one, as we referenced earlier, stanza two and three, all give us more descriptions of what happened on the cross and how we should respond. What Jesus does is wondrous. It's extraordinary. It's incomparable. And so, using those two phrases I referenced at the beginning, what riches do we have that can even compare with the rich gift that God has given us in Jesus Christ? Or what have you done in your life that you are proud of, that you might boast about? Does that even compare with what Christ has done for us? And it climaxes in the hymn at the beginning of stanza four. Were the whole realm of nature mine, everything in the world, if it all belonged to me, that were a tribute far too small. There's nothing that we can do that is adequate a response. As the hymn ends, it says, because love so amazing, so divine, indeed, love so wondrous, demands my soul, my life, my all. Not things, even the whole realm of nature, not anything that we can do or have done. Jesus wants me. He wants you. In the Gospels, Jesus says, 
if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. St. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 12. I urge you, he says, in view of God's mercy, in light of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, I urge you, he says, to offer yourself as a living sacrifice. I like that verse in conjunction with what we're talking about tonight because, of course, a living sacrifice is another oxymoron. Sacrifices, by definition in Scripture, were usually an animal giving its life in place of the person who has done the sin or done the wrong. Often that was a lamb, a lamb that would be sacrificed, blood spilled, so that we would know that we are forgiven. And so on the cross, it is the Lamb of God, as John calls him, John the Baptist in John chapter 1. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It is that Lamb of God who offers himself for us. Watts, St. Paul, all say that all that can be used as a response is our whole being giving ourselves to Jesus. No sacrifice that we make is comparable to what he has done for us. But he doesn't want us to die. A living sacrifice to not give up our life for him, but to live our lives for him. And so this Lenten season, as we move closer and closer to Good Friday, take time to survey the wondrous cross, to realize, recognize that there is nothing we can do that's adequate a response for what he has done for us. Just think for a moment. What would you do for someone who risked his or her life to save yours? You would never feel that you could properly repay that person. Jesus did more than risk his life for us. He willingly sacrificed his life for us. What he wants from us is that we share that story, share his wondrous love, share the sacrifice that he made, not only for us, but for all people. We do that as each and every day we live our lives for him. In Jesus' name, amen. We bow our heads and pray. Almighty God, the Apostle Paul taught us to praise you in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We thank you this day for those who have give, been given to your church to provide great hymns, especially your servants, Isaac Watts and Lowell Mason. May your church never lack hymn writers who through their words and music give you praise. Fill us with the desire to praise and thank you for your great goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you 
and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, we continue our worship by offering our gifts. We at St. Peter are grateful that so many of you have been so generous throughout this difficult time. And we offer various ways of making a contribution. Remember that as you give your gifts, whether you do it on the website or through the app or by texting or the old-fashioned way of mailing it in, that is part of your worship. That is part of giving yourself in response to what he has given you. God bless your offering. Amen. We join together and profess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray, join together in Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, number 917, Savior again, to thy dear name we raise. We sing stanzas one, three, and four. Hymn 917. <laughs> 